And now we have Sonny, who's going to be coming up with our uh, non-human, our probably soul, at least that we're aware of, non-human visitor here at the conference. <laughs> That's right. Okay. So I am just the humble human vector for our <laughs> non-human visitor here, who, of course, we can learn much from. So let me get her out. And thank you, James. So I am, my name is Sunny Robertson. I am one of the 150 plus educators <laughs> that we have at the San Diego Zoo. So I'm located at, down at the Balboa Park campus. And I'm bringing out one of our animal ambassadors. So essentially we've got a, a group of animals that we use to take off grounds to meet folks like you or we go to schools. Um, most of the time that's where we're visiting. We also go to nursing homes and hospitals as well. We bring the zoo to folks who can't make it to the zoo themselves. <clears throat> so let me just get our friend out here. She's coming onto my glove and because I have a, a giant leather glove on, it's probably giving you some idea of what she is. All right, so sometimes she tries to fly. I'm gonna get her tight here and attempt to pick me up. There she goes. Oh, Sham. This is what she does when she sees a big open space. So <laughs> bear with me while Shaman restyles my hair for me. I'm gonna get her back up on my glove there, get her feet comfortable. There we go. Yeah, she is, as you can see, fully flighted. So, and when she comes out into nice big rooms like this, she's like, ooh, I've, I've gotta go hide in the darkest nook over there. But Sham is actually going to come up to the brightest spot in the room so you guys can all see her. And don't worry if you're feeling like, oh, no, poor Al. No, she's used to being in front of like 300 screaming school children who are like, yeah, it's an owl. So you guys are a very quiet audience <laughs> compared to what she is accustomed to. So we're going to work our way up here. And um, I was told they'll project her onto the screen so you can get an up-close view of her as well. Oh, and I should have brought some newspaper. I apologize to the conference people in advance. You might get a souvenir on your floor. <laughs> so that, that is the one thing with a non-human visitor. Humans are usually a little bit better about not doing that. But okay, let me see if I can get her to turn around for you. Um, and do you guys know what species of owl I have brought for you today? Anyone familiar with her? Come on, I'm used to talking to kids who are more than willing to be like, ah! So feel free to, to talk to me. This is a great horned owl. And she, of course, is a native species. So they are found throughout North America, um, even ranging down into some parts of, um, of Mexico. And um, they are typically found in places where there are trees, because you can see she's got this fabulous camouflage. But I want to talk to you a little bit about her adaptations, because I know I'm, I'm following James and, and his wonderful talk to you guys about biomimicry or bioinspiration. And so when I do presentations about this, um, we are actually starting to do outreach with uh, middle school kids right now and talking to them about bioinspiration. Um, one of the things we try to get them to focus on is what do you see? What do you see on this animal? What do you notice? You know, what are you curious about? What do you wonder? Um, that you can learn about her that might inspire you to have a grand idea for something that could maybe help people. So first off, I mean, because she is obviously um, an animal and comes from nature, we do notice that her features and her, her um, adaptations have multiple functions. So the feathers, as I pointed out, fabulous camouflage there. Look how pretty you are, Sean. And um, also, what else do feathers do for owls or, or birds in general? What do you guys think? I told you I'd be asking you questions. They might help her to fly. Good job. <laughs> yes, they help her to fly, of course. Um, unique to owls is the aspect of silent flight. They have serrations on the edges of their, of their primary feathers, their flight feathers, that allow flexibility and airflow through them so that you don't just hear the hitting of their wings against the air. It's much more useful for you when you're hunting at night when it's dark and it's more quiet. Uh, you gotta be extra sneaky. They also basically are wearing their birdie long underwear all the time as well. So she's got soft downy feathers underneath these brown ones that are keeping her warm. And also there is a, a measure of waterproof uh, ability with these feathers. They, 
do repel water. So she's got a raincoat, she's got long underwear, she's got camouflage, she's got the ability of flight, all in this one structure, which is just made of keratin. So pretty interesting that keratin, you know, this, that same protein, of course, that we have our hair and fingernails made of, can come in so many different forms. That is also what her talons, her nails, are made of, and her beak. Sham, you're like purposefully not looking at them, I think. <laughs> they want to see your face. Okay, so there you go. You can see, <laughs> good girl. Sometimes she works with me. <laughs> so, and you can see that, that sharp beak right there, too, is also um, made of keratin. Now, you can see the shape of it, and, and if you guys have observed birds, you'll notice beak shapes are very unique to each individual species. It, of course, helps with whatever type of food they're eating. So what does Shaman eat? Rats. Yes, thank you. Rats, mice. Um, she'll eat lizards, snakes, in fact, up to about 250 different kinds of prey. One of the only predators here of skunks, as well as North American porcupines. Skunk issue, not a problem. She doesn't have a sense of smell, which is not unique. I mean, most birds do not have a sense of smell, actually. But aren't we glad we have these guys around, helping keep those skunk populations down? So what she does when she wants to capture, let's say, a skunk, she swoops down silently grabs them in her talons, and here's the interesting thing. You might think, okay, so her muscles clench, you know, the, her talons closed as she flaps away up into a tree to eat her food with that sharp, pointy, flesh-ripping beak. But the muscle contraction is not actually what's keeping her talons closed. She has a unique ratcheting mechanism with her tendons inside of her talons that essentially lock her feet closed once she's captured the prey which you could imagine helps to save her some caloric energy when she, if she doesn't have to be flexing a muscle the entire time where she's flying away to, to up in the tree to eat her food. Now, she can capture things about three times her body weight, but before that blows your mind, how much do you guys think she weighs? To best guess. 10 pounds? Anyone else? Five? I know, I'm like, I do work out, but, you know. <laughs> She, yes, yeah, she's about two and a half to three pounds, depending on how much she's eaten in the last day. Um, so she is very light for her size, so she's mostly kind of fluffy. Um, and her hollow skeleton. Essentially, that is what allows her to be so light, are those hollow bones. And so she can, you know, take things that are about nine to ten pounds um, in size as her prey, uh, which is, you know, if you've got a... You can hear a little bit of the silent flight there. All you could hear was the wind, not the actual flapping. Sean, no, you're just definitely not looking at them. Okay, well, there we go. I'll just, I'll turn. <laughs> so, um, I'm forgetting what I was saying now, Sean. You distracted me. So, are you going to pellet? You guys might get the full show. Basically, <laughs> what I was going to tell you about, too, is she might pellet for you which was, is very interesting. That's when they actually essentially bleh, bring up <laughs> the, the bones, the teeth, the hair, the nails, essentially all the undigestible parts of the food that they've recently eaten in the last couple of days, which makes sense, right? If you're not able to digest that stuff, why keep it in your digestive tract? Don't do it on me, please. <laughs> I know. And so um, her stomach is able to compartmentalize those items and then just digest the good stuff and bring up the rest of the stuff. Now, I'll talk to you about the last um, thing because she may be starting to tell me she wants to go back into her nice dark crate. But um, the eyes of an owl, right? We, I haven't even touched on that yet. She has enormous eyes for her body size. We always tell the kids, you know, make a fist. If you had eyeballs for your body size the same as an owl's, they would be this big. Uh, so she has very large eyes, but they also not only see very well because of the size of the eyes and the ability to let more light rays into that larger structure, but she has close to a million receptors packed in a square millimeter inside her eye. You have about 200,000. So quite a few more um, receptors there, all packed into a space probably smaller than your eyeball. So that's kind of an interesting uh, thing when it comes to optics or displays uh, for people to maybe explore more about. So they say if she was 
out during the daytime, she can see six times better than you and 10 times better than you at night. Okay, she's seeming to calm down a little bit. I'll tell you also really quickly about her neck and that ability to move the head because that is essentially what everyone always wants to know. Can she turn her head in a 360? Now you guys are older than, you know, eight, so you probably know that she cannot do a complete 360. She would have to snap a few cervical vertebrae uh, to do that. But she does have the capacity of about 260 to 270 degrees. So we always make the kids try it. I'm like, look over your right shoulder. Keep turning your head until you can see your left shoulder. They all, of course, have to try it. None of them succeed. Uh, but it is because we only have seven neck bones. She's got 14. And in between each bone, of course, is the joint that allows the motion. And her neck is essentially like a slinky with all of those bones and joints uh, squished so closely together. The reasoning for the neck, those large eyeballs would require rather large muscles to move had they any muscles attached to them. So she has fixed eyes. They're essentially the structure of a light bulb. They've got the bulb part that you see and a, a fixed portion into her head. So she does not have rolling eyeballs. That way, she, that way she has to move her whole head. So I always tell kids that shaman would be the worst at cheating on a test. She'd get caught every single time. So not that any of them do that, but. <laughs> All right, well, I um, am going to let her go back shortly here, but if anyone has any questions about her or there is anything you wanna know, I could, I could take a couple of questions. Yeah, anything? Mm -hmm. She's panting. Um, which is her way of saying she's starting to want to go back into her crate. So, yeah. All right. Well, I will let the animal speak and I will listen. So I'm going to let her go on back. If you don't mind holding still just for a moment, because sometimes she tries to help me get her back into her crate by flying home. So, and I should tell you guys, by the way, the reason we have Shaman, she was a rescue. Um, but she was picked up as a youngster, and um, she was probably, you know, just learning to fly, and her mom was watching out for her, but a well-meaning person thought they were rescuing a baby. Um, needless to say, she became their pet for a little bit, and then they realized, oh, that's not really a good pet. <laughs> so they turned her into a wildlife rehab place, but at that point, Shaman had already learned that people are not so scary, and they feed me. So she is not a great candidate for release. So we have had her for over 20 years now at the San Diego Zoo. Thanks so much, you guys. Thanks.